Good evening. Today is April 16th, 2018, and I'm Ryan Berg, filling in for Contra Costa County Veteran Service Officer Nathan Johnson. Welcome to our 45th episode of Veterans Voices, titled The Veterans Benefits Administration, Good Benefits, Great People. I am grateful to be joined by Air Force veteran, Concord Vet Center Readjustment Counselor, and co-host, Kira Serna. The purpose of Veterans Voices is to explore the issues that matter most to the veteran community and connect veterans and their families with resources and benefits. If you're at home watching and want to join our discussion, please feel free to call us right now at 925-313-1170. Our phone lines are open and we're excited to take your calls. You can also send us an email at veteransvoices at contracostatv.org or connect with us on Facebook at Veterans Voices One. If you've watched our show in the past, you know that we typically have a shadow box on set behind us as a way to honor the service of a veteran in our community. Well, tonight we are doing something a little different. We don't have a shadow box, but we have someone in mind that we want to honor. Michael Mark Anthony, a friend and mentor of mine, served as an Army medic with the 1st Infantry Division in Vietnam throughout the year of 1966 in and around Benoit. This is difficult for me to talk about, but Michael is currently at the San Francisco VA Hospital undergoing treatment for cancer. Michael, if you're watching tonight, we are thinking about you and you are in our hearts every step of the way. As you've always reminded me, when life is difficult, never give up. Now we would like to welcome Bill Reed to the show. Welcome. Thank you for having me. Yeah, welcome. So what can you tell us about your military history? Well, I enlisted in the Army in 1982 as a light wheel vehicle mechanic. I transferred to the Air Force in 1986 as an aerospace ground equipment mechanic, which essentially we uh, work on the ground equipment to simulate flight on the ground. Uh, I was, uh, I did that for 26 years. I retired mm. as an E-8. Uh, I was involved in almost all the contingencies since Desert Shield, Desert Storm, up to present. And um, I was proud to serve. Uh, I, there's nothing like serving your country and feeling a part of something. So mm -hmm. uh, well, it was a great experience. Thank you for your service. Thank you. And can you tell us a little bit about why you decided to work for the Veterans Benefits Administration? It's kind of it's kind of a funny story. Uh, my mother worked for the VA, and when I got out of the Army, I was looking for a job, and she suggested that I apply for the VA, which I did. Uh, I started off as a file clerk, and I worked my way up to a rating specialist, mm -hmm. and um, I've been doing rating since close to. Over a little over 20 years. Wow. So it's, uh, it's a good job. I, I really enjoy helping veterans uh, obtain benefits they deserve. So you're a, a VA claims raider for the VBA. And what, do you, what does a rate, raider do? What a raider does is it takes, when a veteran files a claim, they list disabilities in which they're filing for. Uh, what I do is, once all the evidence is obtained from private VA, uh, VA examination, so on and so forth, I go through, make sure that the condition was incurred in service. Uh, I make sure that the veteran has a condition now, and then we try to link the, the condition current to the condition in service. Usually that's a medical, that's a medical option, and that's usually provided by a doctor. And what I do is just essentially find uh, their criteria that we follow in the rating schedule. And by that, I, I make sure I check the evidence, make sure all that information is there, and I assign a monetary amount or percentage. Mm -hmm. And what are some of the difficulties you face? That must be um, a difficult job with a lot of pressure. What do you find challenging about it? There is a lot of pressure. Uh, the challenging part is now because uh, Veterans are falling for more disabilities, and what what happens is that they're far-reaching. I mean, we, we see a lot of TBI, and there are a lot of things that come, or there are a lot of complications associated with, say, TBI, PTSD, right. uh, and other disabilities that we have to try to decipher. But uh, that's probably the most difficult, is, is because you're under some pressure to try right. to get the benefits graded. But it's also fulfilling that once you uh, 
break the case and, and the veteran gets what he's entitled to. I mean, I think that's, uh, that's what we're there for. Do you have a particular experience of a veteran you helped that um, you found very fulfilling or that sticks out in your mind? Yes, I do. I had a, a veteran who actually was a mentor of mine at Travis Air Force Base, it's Chief Wilkerson. Uh, he's a Vietnam veteran and he came down with lung cancer, but he did not know that lung cancer was associated with Agent Orange exposure. Okay. And we were able to get him his benefits uh, right before he passed away, unfortunately. So uh, we got him service connected and his wife was able to get death benefits too as after he passed on. But that meant a lot to me because he was someone very close to me. And uh, it, it, you know, it, it's kind of like paying something back for, for someone who was always there for you. Mm -hmm. And he was always there for me. And, you know, I couldn't tell him at the end, but I was mm -hmm. glad we were able to work that out for him. Mm -hmm. What's the favorite part? Do you have a favorite part of your job, something you really enjoy in one aspect? Or? The favorite part of my job is helping vets. Mm -hmm. I mean, we're there to help them get benefits that they are entitled to. And it, it, it's fulfilling when you can rate something and, and a vet will say, you know, we, we see situations where veterans are, are down on their luck. I mean, and it's nice to know that they can reach out to the VA. I mean, there's always misnomers about the VA, about what we do and what we, as far as benefits and grant benefits and, and we don't try to deny anything. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think that's one of the biggest misconceptions we have about the VA is about denying benefits. We will try to grant benefits as much as we can, and, and we go through a, any and every avenue we can to do it. So if we're denying a benefit, it's because there, it, it's just no way for us to grant it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's basically the bottom, the short end of that. I mean, so I just want to remind vets that when you do file a claim, there are veterans working your claims, and we've all been through the VA system. So we know what you're going through, and nobody likes to be denied. So we are trying to grant your benefits. Mm -hmm. When I applied for benefits, it was, a, it was a frustrating process. You know, I didn't know necessarily what to do or how to go about it. And when I did, um, it, it was just frustrating. You know, I, was, I, was, I think I was nervous that um, I was going to be denied and um, just frustrated in general, you know. I, it wasn't actually money that was gonna solve my problem right. in any way, and so I'm, I'm just curious to hear your thoughts. Um, if there's a veteran out there tonight who's frustra just frustrated with the process, how might you encourage them? Um, the key word when dealing with the VA and the process is patience. Mm -hmm. but, uh, there, are a lot of there are a lot of things that go into grant benefits or working a claim. And patience pays, uh, goes a long way in doing that. I, I understand the frustration and um, it, it would be good. I always suggest that a veteran would reach out to, there are a lot of services out there to help veterans file claims and to help you do it the right way. I mean, there are veterans of foreign wars, there's the American Legion, there are service organizations such as so such as that, mm -hmm. that can help you file claims and, and get you, I don't want to put it, but more bang for the buck, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, they, the people that help you understand the process, they know what to go through, they know how the system works, and they can help a veteran maneuver and navigate through this maze of, of paperwork and bureaucracy that, that has been labeled with the VA. Um, but I would always say patience is the key. Be very patient. I mean, it's, it's, it, it is a, a frustrating process, and, and uh, we understand that and, and we sympathize, but you know, patience does go a long way with this process. And so you've been working at this job for quite a while. Yes. And we hear it can have its challenges at times. How do you yourself find balance to avoid, say, burning out or getting tired of the job? Music. Music, oh, okay. <laughs> music. Do you play music? No, I listen to it on a, I, I, I'm a, a jazz listener and I love jazz and when, when times get 
when we hit that point, you know, I just throw on some jazz and, and kind of close my eyes and, and let it, let whatever is going on kind of just slip right by and um, go from there. It's, it's, but it, it's a very fulfilling job and it's, it's not, it's very rarely that I get frustrated doing it. I mean, it's, you know, you're making an impact in somebody's life and their family and, and, mm -hmm. and that in and of itself is a fulfilling part and, and it doesn't create a lot of frustration, but when you do get to those moments, yeah, mm -hmm. a good jazz radio station is, is, is something that, that would get me through. Well, I know you guys can get bogged down, but I think the music is, um, you know, a great way to relax and unwind and cope with that. And I know for myself, I have a lot of clients who use music therapeutically as well. So thanks yeah, for sharing that with oh, us. Oh, it's, it's awesome, man. It's, um, you know, it doesn't take much time. And like I said, you close your eyes, let the music get in, and then you get right back to it. Bill, we have a, a comment question uh, we'd like to, to get to. Um, this is for, for you. Um, Bill Reed has helped a lot of people. This is someone that knows you out there. So uh, what part of your military service uh, has helped you understand a veteran's claim the most? Like experiences. As veterans, we all know and we understand what veterans go through. And knowing that helps you empathize with them because you understand what if, if you came with a claim and and you were in combat I'm I was in a combat zone I'm not a combat veteran but I understand what went on mm -hmm. and I you get that like experiences and it, it makes it easy you you can understand what they're going through and you can kind of put yourself in their shoes and that makes that makes the job a, you know, makes you help them a lot better because you 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 feel their experiences you you know what they've been through mm -hmm. uh, nobody knows a veteran like another veteran so it's it's that type of mindset that you go through uh, to help out your fellow you know we all each branch has a saying about not leaving anyone behind and that's kind of kind of the model you take at the VA when you're helping one of your own is um, I'm not gonna leave you behind I'm gonna do the best I can to get you what you want uh, if I can't you know We'll, we'll, we'll try something that we'll, we'll go another route, but it's like, like experiences, it's always key. It sounds like um, veterans being in the VBA is a good thing for the veteran community. Um, what might you say to someone, um, who, who, some, a veteran who, who got out and is looking for a career and considering the, the VA or the VBA, what might you say to them to say, go for it? or? If you want a fulfilling job helping veterans and using your experiences, uh, whatever you gained in the military, your, your camaraderie with other veterans, uh, the VA is the best way to go because you are helping veterans. You are interacting with veterans. You are, dealing, you, you are talking to veterans and veterans always seem more comfortable talking to other veterans. Mm. You know, they can tell you what they're going on because you understand where they're coming from. And I think a job at the VA is, is one of those jobs that, I mean, it's something that brings, it, it's a fulfilling position. You're helping a veteran get benefits that they truly deserve. And it, it's nothing best than to be in there for another vet. You know, don't leave a veteran behind. Uh, always have a wingman. All these sands come into play when you're dealing with the veteran community. So it's, I was, I, any veteran who'd like to a uh, career, an opportunity, uh, a career with the, v, the VA is, is the way to go. Mm -hmm. um, your mother worked for the VA. Um, do you think your mother influenced you um, in, in your career path? Yes. Yeah, how so? Uh, probably not directly, but she did. Uh, it was a uh, get a job or get out of the house. <laughs> so, uh, it's always a good motivator. Yeah, it's always a good motivator. So uh, she suggested that I take the test, and I went and took the test and uh, passed. And like I said, I started off in, as a file clerk, and then I worked my way up to through. The, I progressed all the way up to to the rating specialist, and like I said, I, the rating specialist position is just something I I just love doing, and it's it's 
it's a very fulfilling position, and I, I can't. I think it's one of the better positions in the VA. Well, we have another question for you. Okay. Um, this question, this person um, who wrote in anonymously asked, "Does Bill ever hear from the people he helps, or is his job mostly anonymous?" Actually, I do hear from some, and uh, and that's why I say that the position is very fulfilling, because when you do hear the good stories, when you do. Uh, someone says, yeah, I talked to Bill. I mean, some people will contact maybe you, maybe someone at the vet center or some other part of the veterans group that helps. And if they say, you know, Bill Reed helped me out or Bill Reed was there or, you know, when I needed it, Bill was there. It, that, that is one of the most fulfilling parts of the job. And that's that means that shows you made a difference, and that's you know that's what we're all here for. That's what we all strive to do. Mm -hmm. Would you be able to share briefly a story without um, you know breaching confidentiality? Uh, someone shed an appreciation. Yeah, I had a um, my uh, superintendent at Travis. He deployed to Iraq, and he came back home, and he had some difficulties back home and mm -hmm. he reached out to me and we spoke and um, I helped him start the process of filing his claim and uh, right now he's 100% and he's getting treatment for uh, the issues that he had and his family is doing great. I mean, his, he's reconnected uh, with his family and he's doing real well. We have lunch every now and then. And again, he, he always says he owes uh, is gratitude to me, but I'm just doing my job. And I, I think I want people to understand that that I don't do it for that. That's the accolades and the thank yous are, you know, that's not, I, I do my job because that's what I'm supposed to do. I do the best I can with how I administer it and and hopefully the outcomes are, are positive and then the veteran feels that I did what I was supposed to do. Well, on behalf of both of us and our viewers, I'd like to say thank you for all you do to help our vets. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. We'll be right back with guest Bob Bentz, a former claims raider. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, a former field examiner uh, for the VBA. And please stay with us. Now we would like to welcome Bob Bentz to the show. Welcome, Bob. Howdy. Can you tell us a little bit about your military experience? Well, I was drafted. I volunteered for an extra year and got some training as a payroll clerk and thought, boy, I'm going to be perfectly protected. And then they uh -huh. sent me to Vietnam and Northern I Corps. And I got to find out what minefields look like and mortars and, and all the good stuff. Oh, okay, so you were drafted and then you volunteered an extra year. Exactly. In the Army, right? Yes. Okay. Um, and where did you go in Vietnam? I spent uh, most of a year at Phu Bai, uh, some time at Quang Tri, which is a little bit closer to the Z, and occasionally we got to go back in the rear to Da Nang. Okay. And so after you got out of the military, did you go straight into working for the Veterans Benefits Administration? No, um, I used the GI Bill to complete a college degree. And four years uh, after I left the service, I went to work for the Social Security Administration as a claims representative. And one day a young man came in who was missing an arm and he wanted benefits and quite frankly, he had never worked. Mm -hmm. 
and I got tired of telling people no at the Social Security Administration. And it happened that I was on a, on a list of eligibles, and VA offered me a job, and in two weeks I was working for the VA. Wow. And I spent 35 years there. Well, you already answered my next question, which was what inspired you to work for the VA? Any, are, other than that, were there any other experiences? You know, you, you've heard about PTSD. Everybody's got their ghosts. Everybody's got the things that haunt them. Well, I was blessed by the VA. I get up every day knowing I have the opportunity to help somebody. And the VA paid me to do something I would rather do anyway. It sounds like you loved your job. I truly did. That's, it was a that's privilege. That's wonderful. Well, let's talk about your job. So you were a field examiner. I've never heard of that. Um, what exactly do you do? Well, basically, the way I acquire, I'm an investigator. Mm -hmm. I'm a cop. I'm a social worker. I'm a benefit counselor. I am, I am the face of the VA. All of my clients are incompetent. Consequently, I'm the guy who makes decisions. I'm the guy who literally goes into the community and evaluates their situation and assures that they're not being taken advantage of and, and guides them to whatever it is they're entitled to. I'm the guy who appoints a payee. If a judge has appointed a conservator, I'm the guy who decides whether or not the judge did the right thing. And sometimes I kind of uh, avoid the judge's court order and find somebody who's closer to the veteran who will do the job for less money and do a better job. Can you tell us about a particular experience that stands out in your mind that was rewarding? Yeah. Um, I'm thinking about a case at Lake Tahoe. Um, this lady was married to a railroad engineer. And he worked 32 years for the railroad. Um, as happens way too frequently, within a couple of years after retirement, a man loses the, his value in his own mind. Uh -huh. He melts into a chair, maybe he drinks a little too much, and one thing leads to another, and he passes away. Well, now she's a widow in a new community where she's moved with a with, they've, they've invested their life savings in a double-wide trailer and a new pickup. And she starts drinking a little too much in the morning with breakfast because she's uh -huh. by herself. She really doesn't know anybody. And accidentally, she sets the stove on fire, and the oh, cops wow. are invited by the sh uh, fire department, and she's 5150. And for the next five years, she's in a mental health gulag, uh -huh. and the county consumed her. And after five years, they invited me to come up and help her out with a widow's pension. They had eaten everything that belonged to her. Wow. She had nothing. Well, I got busy, did a little research, found that they had never applied for her uh, uh, widow's pension with the railroad. She had a pile of money. We're talking five figures here. And I went back to her and said, um, you have a choice. I can get you this pile of money, and you can sue the county, and you got a lead pipe cinch. But quite frankly, why don't you just take this money and get the hell out of El Dorado County and go be whatever it is you want to be? And she said, you blessed me. I am out of here. Wow, that is definitely a life-changing event. That's so I received like a national a, award for that one. Really? Wow. Hey, hey Bob, when we were speaking uh, backstage, you mentioned there's something you'd like to say to veterans maybe out there watching uh, in terms of um, maybe what they might be entitled to uh, that they may not be aware of. What would you like to say to veterans at home watching tonight? Let me keep it simple. You served. Were you ever hospitalized overnight? What were you treated for while you were on active duty? Do you have any scars or marks on your hands or face? Did you break a bone? Uh, did you take an extended course of medication? Um, 
chances are, if you can answer yes to even part of that, you probably have eligibility for a benefit. And more importantly, think about it this way. If you get rated for a, what we call a statutory benefit as opposed to a uh, psychiatric condition, then you will have a contributing factor listed on your death certificate that will help your wife as your widow. Wow. Bob, you're a passionate guy, I can tell. The moment I met you, the moment I spoke with you on the phone, um, I'm curious about what really fuels your passion for doing this work. Well, like I said before, PTSD, um, I chose not to have PTSD. I was blessed with the opportunity to help somebody every day. And even though I've been retired for nine years, I still go out there. I'm part of a, a local charity. I'm planning a Veterans Day parade. I've got a project where I furnish homes for homeless veterans. Um, I'm involved in the community giving back to veterans every day because I have knowledge and opportunity. And it's a blessing to me. I don't have PTSD, I have opportunity. We have a question from uh, our audience. Um, Bob, did being a vet help you get the job at the VA and was there a hiring preference um, because you were a vet? Yes. Um, being a Vietnam veteran, I got a five-point preference. Um, I got on a list of eligibles. I went to work for Social Security. I didn't like that job, and they offered me a job with the VA. It took two weeks for me to make that decision. I have one more question. In your view, what is the VBA, what are they really getting right today, and what would you like to see changed? The VBA that I went to work for in 1974 had hundreds of employees, had three or four guys on every college campus. Our job was to expedite benefits for guys who were trying to get paid to go to school. Um, I had the privilege of uh, working for an organization that was largely made up of veterans trying to help veterans. I'm sorry to say that the VA does not meet that standard today. There are less than 15 people uh, detailed to assist veterans in the office today. Um, str str spread out across Palo Alto, San Francisco, Oakland, and, and Rancho Cordova. Um, there's not a single listed phone number on the West Coast that a veteran can call for assistance, even though 10% of the veterans in the country live in the state of California. Um, it's embarrassing to me that the Veterans Benefits Division that I worked for my entire career is long gone. And the VA today expects a veteran to come in blind with a completed uh, claim. And he has to rely on a county or on a, on a national service officer from a, an organization recognized by Congress because the VA isn't there to help him anymore. So what advice? If you were to um, suggest some changes in the Veterans Benefits Administration today, what advice would you give? What changes would you suggest? Well, I'd like to see the Veterans Benefits Administration bring back the thing called the Veteran Services Division that I work for. We used to have uh, 20 or more people on an 800 number answering calls just from Northern California every day. We used to have an equal number of people on the floor of the office literally interviewing walk-ins, giving guidance to veterans who needed to file claims and needed advice. The, the law says the VA has a duty to assist, but the VA no longer regards that duty as preeminent. Bob, um, we have another comment from our audience. Uh, you say that a wife, uh, a widow, um, can receive benefits um, when her husband passes, but can a husband receive benefits as well if, 
his wife is a veteran and she passes? Absolutely. I think that's the, the, the question. The, the key is that if the veteran has a service-connected disability, be he male or female, um, and that service-connected disability is listed as one of the contributing factors to his or her death on the death certificate, then the uh, widow is entitled to make a claim for like 1500 bucks a month tax-free for life, including a one-time home loan, uh, including an education benefit, including a number of health care benefits. There's a wide range of benefits. What, and, yeah, oh, so it looks like we have another question for you, too. Someone wants to know, what do you do now that you've retired from the VA? You touched on it a little bit. Can you give us a little bit more details about what you're staying busy doing? Well, like I say, I help veterans every day. Um, for the last six years, I've had a, a, a warehouse at the Port of Stockton. I've collected furnishings. And when a, a veteran, a homeless veteran, gets what's known as a HUD-VASH grant, which basically is a subsidized empty apartment, well, I take them out to the warehouse, and I hook them up with a bed provided by the United Way, and a sofa, and a toaster, and a coffee pot, and a lamp, and a whatever they need, kitchen stuff, um, stuff for the living room. And I isolate them there because uh, I'm able to assess their eligibility and guide them to the benefits they're entitled to. There's nothing worse than coming home to an empty apartment and have no income. And I'm sorry to say that that's the way the HUD-VASH program works today. VA really doesn't guide the veterans to the benefits they're entitled to. Well, thank you so much, Bob, for dedicating your entire career to helping veterans. Thank you. We want, to take, we want to take a quick moment to tell you about next month's show. In May, we will be sitting down in the, with the people behind the National Cemetery Administration. The United States National Cemetery System is a system of 147 nationally important cemeteries in the United States. The authority to create military burial places came during the American Civil War in an act passed by the U.S. Congress on July 17, 1862. By the end of that year, 14 national cemeteries were established. A national cemetery is generally a military cemetery containing the graves of U.S. military personnel, veterans, and their spouses. Join us on May 21st to learn more. We will be right back with both of our guests to talk about the rewards that come along with working for the VBA, among other topics. Welcome back. So now we have you both here on the set. And um, we kind of wanted to take a moment to address some misconceptions about the benefits process, about the Veterans Benefits Administration. What have you come across and what do you normally come across that you like to um, tell our audience about? I think one of the biggest misconceptions is how we administer benefits and that you know, we're looking to deny benefits for deserving veterans. Uh, that is not the case. We, what we do is we try to go and forge every avenue we can to grant. I mean, we have claims for secondary benefits and they, not, they may not be eligible for secondary benefits. However, that same benefit may be a direct service connected benefit and we can grant on that basis. So we do our, our, our best to help veterans obtain the benefits that they deserve. And we're just not there to grant five and deny one or whatever. You know, we really work hard. There, many of the people that are doing ratings are veterans, as I said before, and we, we've gone through the system. So we know uh, 
we know it's kind of we know it's frustrating, but we do go through every avenue we can to try to grant benefits. So, okay, hey, Bob. Here in Contra Costa County, you have a very uh, large and effective staff who is highly trained and able to assist you with your claims. Um, in other counties, perhaps you don't necessarily have the same level of service. But there are national service officers, both at the regional office on Clay Street in Oakland, um, and spread around the state. Uh, in particular, I use uh, DAV uh, claims rep in, in, in Rancho Cordova at the alternate VA uh, adjudication site just down the street from the hospital. And uh, she does a hell of a job. She's, she's incredible. Um, it, takes, it takes somebody special for me to trust them with my own claim. Um, you need to talk to somebody who you can trust. And then you need to trust their judgment and instruction and follow through because there are opportunities for you. So when you say follow through, um, what specifically do you mean? Do you mean filing for the claims, filing for the benefits, following up on them? You have to develop your own evidence. You can't necessarily rely on a VA doctor using a VA protocol to know exactly what the truth of the matter is with regard to your own claim. Mm -hmm. So my suggestion is you find a doctor that you can communicate effectively with and you trust that doctor with whatever it is that you have to share and let that doctor guide you in creating medical evidence. Okay. You can't have an effective claim without, a, without medical evidence. Okay. Well, it looks like we have a question for both of you. Um, someone wrote in anom anonymously and said, have Bob and Bill ever worked together? And if so, how did your roles work together? You want me to start up? No, uh, no, I can, I can do my part. Uh, kind of, yes, we worked together, but Bob uh, worked with my mother more so than he did with me. So uh, we had some interactions, but as he said, he was a veterans benefits counselor, and so was my mother, so they interacted a lot. Uh, me and Bob just kind of talked here and there, but nothing, nothing major. I was uh, blessed to be in a, what seemed like a perpetual training mode. So I would move around the building. Uh, at one point, I was the, the uh, chairman of the Committee on Waivers and Compromises. And Bill was a file clerk in that uh, area. Um, at another time, I was in loan guarantee, or I was down in, in veteran services uh, uh, as the operations supervisor. I would see Bill all over the building. In those days, we had 17 floors. Um, the VA doesn't have anywhere near that footprint anymore. So how do your, the roles that you guys work in intersect, or do they? I don't think they do unless he has a question that, he, that relates to what I do. Um, at most parts, at, at most points, uh, they, didn't, they don't intersect really at all. Okay. Bob, Some, sometimes the adjudicator will have questions and will assign a field exam for a guy like me to literally go out in the field and ask the question or make the observation, write a report that gives the adjudicator uh, a little more background, a little more context so that he understands to a greater extent uh, what he's working with. I don't know in the VA that exists today whether or not that's quite as, as elaborate a process as it used to be. Um, Bob, could you say something more about, so you're saying that a, a veteran could go and, and consult a private doctor and then take that evidence and that consult and submit it to the VA as, as valid evidence? Yes. Um, it's up to you to develop your own medical history. If you were treated while you were on active duty for something, or you were treated within one year after you left the, the service, or in some instances with um, some conditions, there literally are presumptive conditions, 
that you can be treated for for the first time up to seven years after you left active duty. It's incumbent on you to uh, raise the issue, to make the claim, to create the medical evidence, to ask some questions, get some guidance, and take it from there. So I want to build on that, and I have a question for you, Bill, as a Raider. When you come across evidence from a VA doctor versus a private doctor, do you weigh, are they weighed any differently? They can be in most instances. Uh, really what the VA doctor is the here and now. Mm -hmm. uh, usually a private physician does not give us the information we require to rate a case. And that's where the VA doctor comes in. But the private physician does give us some outlook as to the condition, the progression of the condition, uh, depending on who the private physician is and how long he was treated. He has a better insight than the VA examiner. However, the VA examiner is what his outlook is what we use as far as making our decision as far as uh, rating the claim because they provide us with the information we need to rate the claim. Okay, great. Thank you for answering that question. And we have another question. Um, this is from April on Facebook Live. For veterans who are service connected and have a disability rating, does that prevent them from working with the VA system? No, absolutely not. No. Can you, can either of you or both of you tell us what advice you would give to other veterans who are, have left the military, they're looking for work, they want to get into work with the Veterans Benefit Administration, what would you tell them? Well, when I went to work for the VA, you got on a list of eligibles by contacting a government office that gave you a test and put you in a, in a, in a, in a, on a list. And uh, I got lucky and found my way to the VA. Okay. I think for any veteran coming out of the military or looking for a career change, that the VA is the best option because it's providing you an opportunity to help other veterans. And that's what a lot of us want to do. We want to look out after each other and take care of one another. And the VA is, is, is the best option in doing that. So uh, if you're looking for a career change, please come aboard and join, join the rest of us and, and uh, help your fellow veteran. Do you work with a lot of veterans personally? I mean, without revealing details, I mean. I do outside the VA. Mm -hmm. Uh, I was the uh, district commander of the VFW District 16 mm -hmm. and you know part of my job was to advise veterans on what to do without really you know letting them understand that I don't directly work their cases but to, to get an understanding of how the process works. That way they don't get caught up in the quagmire of the paperwork or trying to figure out uh, what to do or how to do it. You know, I'm kind of like the resource, and, and I don't mind doing that. I really enjoy doing that because hopefully it makes them feel better about the process, but it makes it easier for the VA to develop the claim because they know exactly what the veteran's claiming. They know precisely what he wants, uh, the situation, and um, it, it, it's a win-win for everybody at that point. Mm -hmm. Well, we're getting a lot of questions tonight, and I want to thank our audience for sending in questions. Um, this question asks, what benefit is underused? Is there a benefit area that more vets should try to pursue? Well, I see a lot of guys who never use their education benefits, which is really the first step of, of, of readapting to civilian life. The government gives you a leg up, and you should take it. Coincidental with that, though, um, oftentimes veterans who have been treated in service for something that they don't really consider uh, that significant, maybe they got a hearing loss because they're in the artillery. Um, when I served, they didn't give us any hearing protection, and I can assure you all of us had hearing loss. But you'd be amazed how many guys I see that, that don't make a claim until prompted. I would agree, uh, GI Bill is probably. Why do you think veterans aren't using that benefit in your mind? I really can't put a finger on it. Um, 
you know, I, I, can, I can use my, the only uh, scenario I can use is my own. I, I, I already have my degree. Um, before I retired, I transferred my GI Bill, my GI Bill to my children, mm -hmm. and my son uses my GI Bill. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, different circumstances dictate why, mm -hmm. why people do or do not use it, but I, I think that is probably one of the most underutilized benefit that veterans have that they don't use. Mm -hmm. um, if you had the chance to make the decision to you know, work for the VBA again, would you? Would you? Absolutely. You yeah. betcha. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, as long as they let me help veterans. Yeah. <laughs> I've had a long career there. Um, I'm happy from, for every moment I've been there. I started from the bottom and worked my way to the top. And I enjoyed the journey, and I enjoy what I do. Um, it's, it's something that's fulfilling. It's something that gives me joy. Mm -hmm. And like Bob said, it's, it's an honor to, to help our veterans. I mean, it's, it's an honor and a privilege to work for the people who serve this country. And, and I, even in, in my retiring days or when I leave, I, I still plan on serving, service uh, as much as possible. I can't help but think you're probably a lot like your mother, Bill. Yes, me and my mother take some of the same things. <laughs> she's, she's just nicer than I am. <laughs> well, thank you both. Thank um, you for having us. Next up, honorary Devil Dog, Shauna Springer had a chance to sit down with what Marines call a boot. A boot is a term of endearment for, all, for a U.S. Marine fresh out of boot camp. Let's watch to see what Connor McIntyre had to say about his experience of transformation and becoming a Marine. In recent years, several organizations have begun to pay attention to the military to civilian transition and the ways we receive veterans back into society. To enrich the conversation, we decided to explore the often overlooked civilian to military transition the formative and deep identity changes that occur when a civilian becomes a member of the military service. Connor McIntyre very recently completed Marine Corps boot camp, and he joins us today to reflect on his transition to becoming a Marine. Welcome, Connor. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. Awesome. So to get us started, uh, we wanted to ask you, when in your life did you want to join the Marine Corps? Can you remember back to that time? Um, throughout my whole life, I always had a, kind of an interest in the military, but the first time I really kind of acted upon it was around last March or April, and that's when I first kind of made the decision, and then from there I talked to the recruiter and got the ball rolling. And what was it that prompted you to enlist in the Marine Corps specifically? Uh, at the time I was in college, mm -hmm. and I felt like it wasn't giving me the sense of direction or fulfillment that I was wanting and um, I knew that the military option would definitely give mm -hmm. me that and have the opportunity to uh, carry on the tradition that my uncle mm -hmm. was a part of. And your uncle, um, for those of you watching, is um, Nathan Johnson, our own host of Veterans Voices. Yep. So that's, it's just so neat to have you here in the studio today, Connor. Um, what was the most inspiring thing that you saw during boot camp? Can you tell us a story? Uh, yeah, so um, the Crucible hike, the Reaper, mm -hmm. it's the most challenging, probably once one of the most challenging parts of boot camp. Um, we were going up the Reaper and our drone instructors, who for the, entire, the entirety of boot camp um, had a more of a disciplinary role. Mm -hmm. And when we were going up it, they were transitioned, they were more of like a motivator. Mm. And they were like, give us motivating uh, pep talks and things of that. So that kind of, like it helped us get up the mountain pretty much. Mm -hmm. So previously they were really after you all to shape you to be disciplined Marines. Exactly. But just before you became a Marine, they shifted yes. and got behind your back and encouraged you to, to make that last push. Yes. I was probably one of the most inspiring things I've seen. Awesome, awesome. What about the most challenging part of Marine Corps boot camp? Was, was that it for you or were there other pieces that... Yeah, the, the crucible was the most hardest part. I'd say the gas chamber was the worst. Mm. That was probably the most challenging, like psychologically, because it, it just sucks really bad, so. Where is your mind going when you've got the, 
you know, gas and you're crying and, you know, it's just so painful. It's, it's like pure, it's pure panic, kind of. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so the, the task is to keep yourself kind of in the moment, even though your mind wants to... Yeah, avoid going internal. Yep. Yep, because then you're just, you're worried about yourself, and you're not worried about the people around you. So you have to um, make sure you're keeping a good mindset, mm -hmm. clearing your gas mask, getting back, you know, into the fight, I guess, getting, mm -hmm. you know, not suffering from the smoke, basically. Mm -hmm. So you're suffering, but there's a bigger thing there, which is you're learning how to be part of this fighting force. Right. And it's not about you. You know, you're really yeah, exactly. looking out for each other. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, looking back, how has the experience of becoming a Marine changed you? Has it changed you in any surprising ways? Um, actually, I would say it's, it's hard to tell because you, you do the transition over 13 weeks, and so I can't, I can't really tell. Mm -hmm. However, certain people, like my family, they have the like sheer cut off from seeing me as a civilian and then all of a sudden seeing me as a Marine. So they say that I'm set up a little straighter, mm -hmm. uh, walk a little taller, mm -hmm. things of that, a little more squared away, I guess. Definitely. Can you remember some of the values that were sort of part of this experience that are now very important to you as you go forward in life? Um, yeah, the core values, honor, courage, commitment. Mm -hmm. Um, also, integrity and discipline, those really carry. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, sometimes people come back from boot camp and they have some pretty funny stories. Do you have any funny stories from your time in boot camp that you'd be uh, willing to share with us? Yes. So, it's not really the kind of stories that a civilian would kind of find funny, but it's the kind of story that in the moment, mm -hmm. because you're going through all of it, um, it's kind of funny. So, like, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to cuss, but... Um, we can we can edit it out, so oh, okay. go but, for it. Um, like, one, a recruit would go up to the drill instructor and ask, um, ask, hey, uh, or he'd say, uh, proper greeting, good morning, sir, this recruit requests to make a, permission to make a head call to go use the restroom. Yeah. And the drill instructor would just say, F off, or something like that. Yeah. And it, it's in the moment, it's kind of funny yeah. to see. Yeah, you learn to speak Marine, right? Yeah. And at some point you learn that F off means, hey, I got your back, or you know, you're one of us, or something like right. that. Right. So part of the transition as well. Uh, now, you've just had an experience of rapid transformation, of being a civilian and becoming a Marine. As you think about that experience, what advice would you give to someone who may be thinking about joining the military? Um, someone who's thinking of joining the military, I'd say talk to a recruiter first and prepare physically. Okay. Um, also learn some knowledge like general orders, rank structure, um, things of that sort. What else? I'd say things so like that. There's a physical preparation. I'm um, doing pull-ups and things that you know, you're gonna be tested on later, but what about the, the uh, mental preparation? Because it seems to me that so much of this transition is about getting yourself into a new headspace and holding different values um, a as you move forward. How would you recommend that people prepare mentally for Marine Corps boot camp, for example? Um, I'd say the, the recruiters actually can help a lot with that because uh, every, I think it's once a Saturday, they do a pool function. Okay. And uh, that's where they do some sort of exercise, maybe they go on a hike with like a lot of weight and things like that where they, pu they push you to your limits. Mm -hmm. Or one time we had a obstacle course and the uh, recruiters acted like drill instructors mm -hmm. and that was pretty intense. That, that actually I think helped me a lot to kind of get an idea mm -hmm. of what it's like to all of a sudden have someone screaming in your face. Yeah, actually that seems like to me it could inoculate you a little bit against that initial shock. Yeah, definitely. It's not the first time. Some, some, a lot of people um, in receiving week actually they would get, they just got scared and then they quit uh -huh. because, you know, they they weren't told, oh, this is this is what it's like. This is like people screaming at you and it's intense and really stressful situations. Mm -hmm. Where I think they would have been a lot better off if their recruiters would have prepared them um, with things. That yeah. So you had a good recruiter. Yes. And that's maybe something that people can take away if they're watching. We have some people that are watching who may be recruiters. 
that giving you that little bit of a sample of what might be coming can make a difference Definitely. for some, some Marines. Yeah, I'd say, in fact, more that's more important than the physical aspect. I agree. Because they can prepare you um, in boot camp. There's like really low minimums mm -hmm. uh, physical standards wise, mm -hmm. but they don't really prepare you for the, mm -hmm. the shock, the stress of the boot camp. Yeah, totally. So what's next for you, Connor? Um, from here, I'll be leaving to go to Marine combat training. Okay. And after that, I'll be going to MOS school and then hitting the fleet. Sweet. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in. It's such an honor and congratulations, Marine. Thank you for having me. Thank you. We hope you've enjoyed our show tonight. Before we go, we want to direct you to a few resources and events. Among the benefits that the VBA offers, they provide a home loan guarantee benefit and other housing related programs to help you buy, build, repair, retain, or adapt a home for your own personal occupancy. Visit benefits.va.gov slash home loans to learn more. Did you know that the VBA offers life insurance? As part of their mission to serve service members, veterans and their families, the VA provides valuable life insurance benefits to give you the peace of mind that comes with knowing your family is protected. Visit benefits.va.gov insurance. Are you a veteran ready to further your education and skills? Apply for VA education and training benefits online, in person, or request an application over the phone. Visit benefits.va.gov slash GI Bill to learn more. Are you a veteran who would like community for your voice to be heard? Well, our A Veterans Voices segment is designed to provide space for veterans to share anything they want about themselves, such as poetry, a story, or a piece of art. Our program wants to support you by inviting you onto our A Veterans Voice segment. Please connect with our show by emailing veteransvoices at contracostacountytv.org. To rewatch tonight's episode, check back on our homepage later this week or check your cable provider's schedule for rebroadcast times. Our next live broadcast will be Monday, May 21st, 21st at 7 p.m. Be sure to tune in. This is Veterans Voices of Contra Costa County signing off, wishing you all a relaxing evening. And for the veterans out there watching tonight, Hua and Ura! <laughs>